Hello, everybody. My name is Tom Jones. I'm the executive director of the Aerospace Museum of California. And today I am here with Dr. Story Musgrave. And Dr. Musgrave is, is, is a six time space shuttle astronaut. And he has an amazing story. I've heard his story. I've had the pleasure of going out to dinner with him and just having a, a, a full couple of days of hanging out with him and hearing great stories and learning all, more about Hubble and, and, and his incredible role at NASA. Uh, so today we're going to celebrate NASA Hubble's 30th anniversary in space and uh, ask Dr. Musgrave a couple of questions uh, regarding his role with Hubble uh, during, during the early days of its, uh, of its inception. So Dr. Musgrave, uh, Hubble has dramatically changed mankind's understanding of the universe. Just kind of explain how you how you feel about that and how what you think Hubble has done to help mankind. Uh, well, Tom, it's um, a very tiny telescope, you know, 35 or 40 years old. It got deployed later than we planned, and yet it gives us the most powerful view of the universe that we've ever had. And it does that because it is an almost totally pure viewing, you know, out there at uh, Statue Miles. But the other thing about it is it can uh, take an, an exposure forever. It can do a 100-day exposure, if that's what you would like, because of its fine guidance sensors. In, in other words, uh, it has optical tracking on it. It has three fine guidance sensors as powerful as the big camera the wide field planetary camera so it can hold a position forever and also if you do an exposure today and you would like to continue the same exposure next week you can do the same exposure next week because the fine guidance sensors without need for navigation can freeze that thing in exactly the same place and so with it you're only looking for a few photons you know so that's right. that's the nature. That is the nature of the Hubble Space Telescope. I think our audience would love to hear your story about that repair mission. Yeah, um, it's very important to understand that I didn't go fix it. I I picked up Hubble in 1975. I've been with that beauty now for um, 45 years. I picked it up in '75. They told me, and every time I use me, I'm talking about the gang. I ain't talking about me person. I'm talking about the gang I'm working with. But I was your lead spacewalker for NASA for um, for 20 some years. I picked that up in 1972 from Rusty Schweikart. We were in the Skylab program, so I was backup crew on the first uh, Apollo Apollo's Saturn uh, Skylab mission. So I wasn't just shuttle, but um. I had been in mechanics my whole life. I'd been a mechanic on a farm at age 9 or 10. I'd been a heavy construction equipment mechanic. I was an airplane mechanic with the Marines. I was a tank mechanic uh, all the way through college with the Marines. Maybe that's partly why I got it. But they told me in 75 to look after this machine we're going to put in space. And uh, for me and the gang to identify every possible failure it could get into and what we're going to do about it with a spacewalk. So Hubble was the very first machine, the very first satellite we put in space, designed ahead of time to be uh, looked after with spacewalking. Uh, so me and the gang, uh, we identified, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of fares that it could get into. And um, I was used to tracking machines and looking at the future of machines. I used the skills of NTSB, not so that I can in investigate the past, but so I used their nuanced uh, analysis of what could happen to a machine. And I built a futuristic possibility for the machine. And so, and then I came up with uh, me and the gang, 300 tools and thousands of pages of procedures for what you're going to do to fix this problem. So I started doing that in uh, in 1975, and of course, 15 years later, uh, it got into space uh, today, uh, 30 years ago. And uh, on the SDS-31, the mission that carried up there, I was the lead communicator in mission control. 
And so uh, a lot of people don't know that, but I was the lead communicator for uh, 25 missions. Not only my own uh, six, you know, but I learned uh, 25 missions. So we uh, it launched here on April 24th, but we deployed it the next day on April 25th. That would be 30 days, uh, 30 years from tomorrow. And uh, we had a very, very difficult day. The solar panels would not deploy. To I had uh, Bruce McCandless and Catherine Sullivan. I had them in the airlock, partially depressed, getting ready to go out the door and put the ratchet wrenches in. Yes, ratchet wrenches. Of the 300 tools I came up with, 50% were from the hardware store. And so with NASA quality, of course. Another 25% of those tools were slightly modified. And the final 25%, the task was so excited, I had to come up with tools designed just for that job. But we finally, it turns out, the solar rays were detecting too much stress, and so they were inhibiting the deployment. Now, it's so important that once we had detached Hubble from the shuttle, there was no way to reconnect the electrical umbilical. We did design a Hubble to be brought back home in the shuttle. So we could have brought it home that day, or we could have gone and got it years later and brought it home. But that would have been a terrible thing to have to bring it home after having it uh, out there at almost 300 miles. We no-opted those uh, those stress gauges and got it out. So uh, that was our day on uh, on April 25th. So, Story, what what is your favorite memory? You know, for you've been on six space shuttle missions. And what, what's your favorite memory from all of those missions? It's hard to come up with a favorite, but I think a night pass, uh, the night passes are just so outrageous you can barely stand them. If you take the time and, and fold all the computer lids down and turn all the lights off so you're totally dark and have to look at the heavens. And so what you're seeing out there is just outrageous. You're seeing galaxies with the naked eye and um, the Milky Way is just a hard, hard wall of light, and you actually navigate instead of looking at, you know, uh, the different uh, galaxies and constellations. You actually see where am I on the, yeah, you know, that white wall that uh, the Milky Way galaxy and right. left and right off. But um. And the meteoroids coming in. We had the, the lyrics this week, but um. They come in all the time, and so if you take the time and you get in the window, you see meteoroids coming in all. You thank everyone for leaving you alone on the way in because they're between you and Earth, you know. They're not above you, the shooting stars. They're between you and Earth, of course, as they burn up in the, uh, in the air. You see the moon racing across the ocean and the moon racing down the rivers. You only see the part that's reflected in the river. And so the moon is coming down at 25,000 feet per second, roaring down the rivers. And then you look at the aurora, which is moving, of course, at immense speeds. And uh, the pink and the green shooting up and down and moving over the territory. Because, of course, like a wave, um, it doesn't have to move through the air. It's just a wave that goes through it. And Dr. Musgrave, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and okay, we look Tom. forward to hosting you at the Aerospace Museum of California again in the near future when all this clears up. And uh, we wish you yep. safety and health, and uh, and we will talk to you soon. You too, sir. Same for Thank your you. audience.